March 29th, March 28th here for the Monday Thursday, and March 29th, 9 to, to 1.30. So please see Nancy if you can help with that. Easter egg hunt is coming up on March 30th. Please see Elisa, Elisa, Elisa if you can help with that. And the Easter worship celebration is coming up in how many weeks? Two weeks. March 31st. Can you believe it? And then in, we have a special Easter offering that day for mission work. So don't forget to uh, come prepared on Easter Sunday to give a special offering for world evangelism for that to take place as well. Today is the day the Lord has made. I will. And me. You know what is even better about the fact that the Lord has made this day? What's even better is that you can stay here for lunch. There is a St. Patty's Day potluck dinner. The tables are set up down in the gym. If you didn't bring food, that's okay. Go to Burger King, grab a sack lunch, go to Bellaria, grab something to go, and come back because the most important thing about potluck dinner is being together. As a fa How many of you like to eat together as a family? That's right. That's what this is. You know, um, Nikki has worked hard. My wife works tirelessly at trying to plan events for you to be together. I saw a bunch of you ladies painting barns down in the gym last night. And I'm not talking about makeup. If the barn needs paint and paint it, as my friend Jerry West said, he gets credit for that. But um, so every time that we do those events, men's group, those things, it is a way to be together as church. How many of you know the people sitting around you in church today? Do you see, you see them? You know them? Think about this. Do you know who they are, or do you know them? Because the reality is, and I had a lady tell me one time at the bank, she said, I've been going to the same church for 13 years, sitting in the same seat for 13 years. And she said, it dawned on me. I know the people sitting around me. I know who they are, but I don't know them at all. Sitting with people in a, in a room while somebody else is doing all the talking, you can't get to know the people that you're sitting here with if I'm doing all the talking, if they're doing all the singing. The only way you get to know the people that are a part of your faith family, come to lunch, come to dinner, come paint, come to men's group, eat donuts, eat, eat potluck, eat. You know, the most important thing to do as a family is eat. Amen? Can I get a witness? Go to breakfast, go to lunch, go to dinner, come people to your house, go, to, go with people. The way that we grow as the family of the Lord is by eating. And as a part of that, I've already been to Wendy's, uh, well, we've been there like seven times, eight times, a lot. Yeah. But, but I made a friend there, and I invited him to church this morning. He checked us out on Facebook. He said he's going to come, so I'm going to trust that he's going to show. But that's how you become family, is sharing the love of the Lord in all things more than just in church. Nancy, I can see that look. I know it means I'm supposed to read something. Please let people know that I'm desperate need of class leaders for Good Friday camp. Just have to go from station to station with the children. I currently have, how many do you think Nancy has? How many do you need? She needs at least three, prefer to have six. How many do you think she already has that signed up to volunteer for Good Friday camp? Zero. Don wins. If you thought you volunteered, you haven't told Nancy. Stand up, Nancy. This is Nancy Gamble. She is our children's organizer, leader. She's, she is the one who's making this happen. So please let Nancy know all you got to do is not be allergic to children, be willing to be with them without physically harming them. And just walk them from place to place and make sure they don't get lost. It's not, even Chuck can do it. Sign up, Chuck. Come on. Take a day off work. All right. Please let Nancy know. Grab her and let her know before you leave today. Today is the day the Lord has. I will. Look around. Let's say it again. I want you to look at somebody else when you say that. And I want you to judge them. I will. Are they rejoicing? And be in it. Amen. If they're not looking like they're rejoicing and being glad, then help them during worship. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your love, your grace, your mercy. Help us this day to have the joy of the Lord as 
as David prayed, restore to us this day the joy of our salvation. May our salvation be more than a goal to get us to heaven when we die. May it be a joyful experience on the journey of life that we're in until we come home to you. In Jesus' name we pray and everyone said, Amen. Let's stand together as we worship. Good morning, everybody. Would you please stand as we share the word of the Lord together? We're reading from Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 33. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. You know, that's pretty powerful uh, prophecy right there. Jeremiah is speaking to Israel, but he's also speaking to us, you know. He's going to write his law on our minds, and he's going to write it on our hearts. And that's what happens when he comes into our lives. And then all of a sudden, we, his desires become our desires. And our, his goals become our goals. And his guidance becomes our internal forever guide. And that is something to praise the Lord about because that, you know, it could be something. There's so many things that are fleeting in this world now. It comes easy, it goes easy. But Jesus comes in and he's a forever and he's an eternal. And he creates us to be eternal with him when we come to him and receive him. So join us as we worship the Lord. I hope you got your praise on this morning because we're going to praise the Lord a little bit this morning. Remember, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I want to hear you. Yeah. You can clap your come hands. On. Everybody, join come us. On. Come on. Do you, are you breathing today? Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Do it again. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley. Praise on the mountain. I'll praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I'll praise when outnumbered, praise when surrounded. I'll praise is the waters, my enemies drowning. As long as I'm breathing. i 
Praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. I'll praise cause you're sovereign, praise cause you reign. Praise cause you rose and defeated the grave. I'll praise cause you're faithful, praise cause you're true. Praise cause there's nobody greater than you. Aren't you so thankful for God that we can just praise? We can offer whatever broken pieces we have, and he accepts it as the most beautiful praise that we, the gift that we can ever give him. So I'm just thankful for a God who accepts our praise and just hears our praise from our heart. So we are going to move on to friendship time, so go ahead and greet one another. Good, I 
keep it inside. I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep it inside? Yeah, I, I won't be quiet, my God is alive. How could I keep it inside? thankful for that blood today. I am so thankful. The wonder working power of the blood. It is truly wonderful. I'm so thankful. This next song we're going to sing is uh, the great I, or great I am. I have a couple scriptures I'd like to share. Um, and God said, I am the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end says the Lord, I am the one who is, who always was, and who is still to come. 
the Almighty One, Revelations 1.8. Before the mountains were born, or, or you brought forth the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you were God. You know, God is, he is who he is in all circumstances. I am glad that we, in all the circumstances that we have, whether it be financial struggles or emotional, spiritual, whatever it is, God is there. God is the great I am. So don't hesitate. Don't hesitate with anything that he might have for you today. Or do not deny the power of the great I am. Sing with us. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Hallelujah. Holy, holy God. and shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am the great The great I am, the great I am, the great I am. Hallelujah, holy, holy, God Almighty, the great.
mountains shake before you, the demons run and flee. At the mention of your name, King of majesty, there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. As we go to as we go to prayer this morning, let's continue to lift up. Abby made sure to tell me. Emily is going to be coming home from Dominican Republic. We've been there on a mission trip. So pray for Emily. My friend Jim, uh, former bus driver Jim Forney, is in Cleveland. His grandson had let me know that uh, they didn't do the surgery, but he actually had been improving. He was off the vent. He was speaking. He was eating by the grace of God. So thanking the Lord for those improvements. Not all the woods yet. Chris Eckleberry, still in the hospital in Canton, been getting updates, but uh, late stage pancreatic cancer and uh, the doctors are doing what they can. So it's just been a roller coaster for the family to be praying for them as well. Um, I know uh, Jenny Smith's been sick. She was talking about going to the doctor and uh, let's continue to uh, Lift up those who have been sick, those who are going through struggles, financial, emotional. Uh, among the praises, it's so good to see Ray and Sandy here this morning. And um, God bless them with an opportunity to, uh, to get away and to come back to some better news than what they were hoping for. And we're just trusting the Lord. You know, years ago, Oswald Chamber um, said, beware of praying that those for those who are suffering, that God would take away their suffering. And when you love somebody, it's hard to watch them suffer. Nobody enjoys that. And I've been profoundly aware in my uh, life recently, I wake up every morning praying for those I love who are suffering. But the Lord reminded me of this scripture in Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings. Can I get an amen? amen. You didn't mean it. Who glories in their sufferings? And Paul says why you can glory in your sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom He has given to, been given to us. And uh, Lord, just this morning has been speaking to me, you know, I spend a lot of time praying that God would remove suffering from the lives of those I love. But he's challenging me to pray that God would use the suffering because God uses that suffering to produce something in us. I mean, most of us, you know, my age or slightly beyond my age, how many times in your childhood can you remember that if there was such a thing as child protection services, they would have been called at your house. Hey, Amen. Can I get a witness? But guess what that suffering in that childhood produced in us? Character, 
hope, perseverance. So this morning as I pray, I'm not praying simply that God would remove suffering, but that He would move through our suffering to produce a greater work, a greater character, and a greater hope in our lives. Let's pray. Father, as we come this morning to pray, we give you praise. As we talked about last week, you don't save us from fires or from lion's dens. You save us in the midst. My prayer is that you would move in the midst of the suffering of your saints and that you would use our suffering as a motivation, as, as a hammer and a chisel to, to form and to mold us into the perfect likeness of your son, Jesus Christ. Have your way and do your work in our lives through the path of suffering, through the path of blessing, through good days, through bad days, and all days. May these lives come to reflect the love that you have for us as you mold us into those who love as you've loved us, forgive as you've forgiven us. We do pray for Chris, and Lord, I pray for Sandy and Ray, and Lord, I pray for Jim, I pray for Emily, I pray for those who are traveling, those who are out busy doing your work, Lord, I, I pray for the opportunities that you will give us to be your salt and your light in this earth as we go forth and as we come home, as we travel, as we work, as we are in our leisure at all times, may we just be aware that you're giving us opportunities as those who sow the seed of the gospel of peace into the lives of those you bring across our path. We thank you for this day, for this opportunity to love you, to praise you. Thank you that you are the great I am. As Don read, the one who is, who was, and who will always be. Our suffering, or the suffering of those that we love, have not escaped your mind. Lord, as I was speaking to Terry this morning, Lord, the, as, as you uh, are revealing to her through the doctor's things that she must go through, this is not a surprise to you. You've known it all along. You've allowed these things in our lives. Now may we embrace the path that you've set us on, knowing that you can deliver, trusting you to deliver. But in the midst of the flames, may we know that we are not alone. There is one walking beside us holding our hands, guiding us through. May our light lips praise you, and may our lives show forth the truth of your love in our lives. We love you this day. We give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Christ's name I pray, and everyone said, amen. Before we move on, we have two that have been asked to be anointed, so come and gather around the altars as we pray for those. Jane is asking for prayer for a couple of co-workers, uh, a worker and their, their spouses, uh, one in her 40s, just had surgery for breast cancer, and the other one is uh, Giannone that we prayed for before, they're beginning to reconstruct his trachea, and he's been through a lot, and just continue to pray. and praying for Jane's witness. These are non-believers. Father, we honor Jane's request to come to you this morning, Lord, and we want to lift up these spouses of these co-workers, knowing the physical needs and the surgeries and the uncertainties of their physical outcomes, Lord. You know the outcomes, and may you just continue to give Jane the words. You promised that if we open our mouth that you would fill it. No matter who we stand before, kings and authorities and co-workers. 
And I just pray, Lord, that you would bless these lives that are in Jane's heart, that you've set them on her heart. Give her wisdom and discernment. Give her those opportunities just to be your voice into the lives of these who have yet to trust you for themselves. Lord, we anoint Jane in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the sure hope and the certain trust that you're going to speak through these difficult days in the lives of these people and as your scripture just said through our sufferings lord you work perseverance and you give us hope may you just be with these spouses and these co-workers of jane and give her confidence and boldness as she just proclaims the hope that is in you and you alone for their lives and their needs in christ's name i pray lord i want to anoint tris this morning and just want to lift up chloe to you lord you and you alone know her need lord you gave this little life as a blessing and as a as a as a gift lord i'm amazed when i look at my own life children and grandchildren you have trusted into our care it's quite an amazing thing that you would look at our lives and the messes we've made so often and still trust these innocent lives into our care, into our keeping, trusting us to speak to them and to live out your love to them and show them the path that you have for their lives, to know you, to trust you. Lord, you know Chloe's life. You, you had all the days of it recorded in your book before she ever came into this earth. And now, Lord, you know exactly how you want to use uh, Austin and Trish and Chloe's life, how you want to bring her closer to them and closer to you, how you want to use her in her own family. Lord, we just pray that right now that you would come in a powerful way upon Chloe and help her open her eyes and her heart to your presence in everyday mundane circumstances. May she again and again catch a glimpse of your love and of your grace for her life. Lord, we anoint Trish for Chloe, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in the sure hope and the certain trust that Trish will be faithful as a caregiver and as a guardian of this young heart and this young life, this young spirit. Be with her and, and Austin and mom and dad and help them, Lord, to not only speak the truth of your love, but to begin to experience it in new and profound ways as never before. We are just giving you the thanks that you've already been active in her life in the past. You're active now, and you're going to continue to be with her in the future. The God who was, who is, and always will be will never quit loving Chloe or drawing you to herself. You're drawing her to yourself, Lord, and we just trust that, that uh, prevenient grace that goes before be with her and just continue to draw her into your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. 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 Lord, please be with Emily and just give her safe travels and mercy. Get her back home to Abby. Abby misses her, Lord. We thank you for protecting her. We anoint Abby in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and the sure hope and certain trust for the love that she has for little Emily and for your love for Emily and your protection and your hand to bring her back safe. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I got a hot mic and it's going once, going twice. Ray, I saw it on your face before we started praying. <laughs> It's hard not to share. You know, most of you guys have been with me and Sandy for this journey for 18 years. And when we got the news back in December that Sandy had cancer in the new liver that she got a year, a little over a year ago, it kind of broke us. I mean, honestly, it's the first time in 17 years that Sandy's looked at me and she says, I don't think I can beat this. We said, Lord, here it is. It's your turn. We went through, she got a, I guess I'm going to tell a long story because it's just me. When she first got the PET scan, she had three two to three millimeter spots on the liver. So she 
got the PET scan. They said, hey, there, we need to get this looked at. We went to Cleveland. Cleveland said, okay, we're doing an MRI. The MRI showed actually a few more lesions on the liver. She did a biopsy. The biopsy showed more. Sandy was able to see the ultrasonic things saying there's this stuff on her liver. So they finally hooked us up with the doctor the 1st of January. They finally could say, what are we going to do? They did another PET scan. You know, I really don't know. They, they put the PET scan from one, the first PET scan up. They put the second one up. And if you know anything about PET scan, this cancer lights up. Well, to us, you know, it was Christmas was passed, but the second PET scan looked like uh, a major Christmas tree. So it just scared the crap out of us. He said, okay, you need to start doing chemo and do these three, and I want to see you in a couple months after we get the next PET scan. So Sandy went through three rounds of chemo, two UTIs in the hospital for a week. Came time for this next PET scan, and the doctor, two weeks ago, we were, she was getting her third round of chemo and said, we're going to do the PET scan in two weeks. And Sandy said, in two weeks? I've been waiting on this thing for three months. I need to know what's going on. She says, I don't think, you know, I don't know whether it's working or not. And the doctor looked at her back then and he says, it's working. You wouldn't be the way you are if it wasn't working. And that gave us some hope. We come into the next PET scan on Thursday. And Sandy and I were sitting out in the parking garage in Salem. And we said, okay, here it is, Lord. We're going to find out what's going on. And I prayed over Sandy, and I said, Lord, we have the faith to know that you can heal her. But my mind has the doubt that it's going to happen. And I said, Lord, please do something that will even amaze the doctors, because that's the only way we're going to know what's happening. She had her PET scan. Sandy's been going to the hospital in Salem for so, so long. She's, she knows almost everybody up there. The nurses and the, or the radiologists in the back did the PET scan and said, well, Sandy says, I need to know. She says, well, we'll try to find Dr. Apicella. And he was doing a, a uh, biopsy so they couldn't get him to read it right away. And the girl took her cell phone number and says, we're going to get the doctor back there and read this. And we're, you're going to know what's going on. And 20 minutes later, Sandy and I stopped to the feed and sing for breakfast, afternoon, whenever it was. And we're sitting there and the phone rings. It's the thing. The girl says, Sandy, are you sitting down? And she says, yeah. She says, looking for good news. And she said, yeah. She says, well, the PET scan shows that almost all the cancer has gone in the liver. And we really don't see the, the, any cancer in the spot in the lung that they're calling it. Because they call it small cell lung cancer that's in her liver. So the report actually shows up on her portal that night, and I read through the report, and the report says the, th the three spots on her liver have been resolved, and there's no new lesions. And for us, that was like, it's gone. You know, that amazes us. We're, she got a phone call the next day from the oncology, and they were all happy that things are going good. We've not sat with the oncologist and said, oh, what's next? But our praise is, for right now, we saw a miracle. God took care of that. And I just praise him for that this morning. Amen. You know, Lazarus was brought back, from, back to life from the dead, but even Lazarus died. And the thing that we got to remember is we don't fear death. One of the things I praise the Lord for in Ray and Sandy's life is they went to Disneyland. <laughs> Even with, you know, Ray, he says, you know, I got some doubt. Remember the father that Jesus said, you know, he, he says only these things happen through prayer and, and uh, you know, believe, believe. And he said, I believe. Now help my unbelief. Because those doubts kind of sneak up on us. But here's the thing, Ray and Sandy have not failed 
to live the life God's given them to live in the shadow of this difficult things. Don't let your circumstances cost you living the life you have to live. None of us know the days, know the moment of the hour. But when we're sitting here today, we know this moment is a moment that God has given us and the moment that God has called us to enjoy the life. Jesus said, I have come that you would not only have life just barely squeaking by, just barely making it. What do you say, Ray? Life abundantly. A life abundantly. And that's what we're called to. Amen? All right, out of that abundance, give with joyful hearts. Ushers, come forward this morning as we receive our morning tithes and offerings. And if at any time... <laughs> if at any point that you want to give praise to the Lord this morning, not cutting anybody off, this, this place is your place. You feel called to come and give Him a praise, you do so. Dave, would you bless the offering this morning? Happy St. Patrick's Day! Who knows who St. Patrick was? Drunk. A what? <laughs> Drunk? Oddly enough, you know, I was just talking this morning to somebody. I said it's amazing how Satan can take um, a beautiful story of one's life, a legacy, and, and twist it. St. Patrick, at the age of 16, he lived, he was 5th century, around 495 A.D., he was living in Roman Britannia. Rome uh, was occupying Britain, what is now Britain, and ruled, and that's where he was born. That's where at age 16 he was kidnapped by pirates and marauders who took him to the, to the island of Ireland. He served there as a slave for six years. Now, his father was a Christian. He was brought up in the Anglican Church at the time, or um, Catholicism, as we would know it today. And he, in those six years of being very poorly treated, being mistreated, he turned to his faith during that time and uh, became a very devout follower of Christ and trusted God. One night in a dream, he had a vision of a ship that was sailing away from Ireland back to Britain. And the Lord spoke to him and said, get on the ship, I'm taking you home. And six years after he'd been kidnapped, so it would have been 22 years of age, got on the ship, got out of Ireland, escaped his slavery, and went back to home. Now, he was briefly in prison for a time again back home. He faced starvation and death a couple different times. Um, but then God spoke to him and said, all right, now you're going back. I want you to go back. I'm going to use you to evangelize the people of Ireland. So he had a hard decision to make. I mean, think about 
this young man, robbed of six years of his life, starved, beaten, uh, undoubtedly tortured in many ways through his experience, and was going to go back to the people who had mistreated him and enslaved him at the knowledge that it could cost him his life. That was a pretty big decision to make. Amen? Anybody here ever have to make decisions? How many of you love making decisions? Some of us really struggle with that, right? Yeah. Dad. And mom. You don't, you're not safe from Abby. She's going to tell on you. It can be hard to make decisions, but... How many of us here today would make the choice, that rough decision, to go back to the place of our suffering for the sake of our testimony of our relationship with our Heavenly Father? And that's, I think that's, in preparing for this, that's why my mind was drawn to Romans and Paul's words. We glory in our suffering, for it produces perseverance. You look at the life of St. Patrick, he, is, he had suffering. He knew suffering. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, sometimes I'm amazed at what people survive. 16 years of it. How many 16-year-olds do you know today of the current generation who could handle being kidnapped, taken away from their family, put out in the field with a bunch of sheep and be told that this is your job? You'll eat when we say you eat. You'll drink when we say you drink. No money, no reward, no praise, just simply ripped away from your family. And then after six years of that and escaping it, willingly saying, all right, God, I suffered a lot. These people mistreated me, they abused me, but I'm going to go back because you tell me to go back. And making the decision to get on a ship, to sail back. I mean, can you imagine how he's feeling as he's approaching those shores? How is he going to be received? Is he going to be murdered on the spot? You know, he knows he's going to run into his former, his former master. And yet, he lived out the rest of his life. He basically evangelized the entire nation of Ireland. Now, um, you know, Ray reminded us that miracles happen. Some people think that St. Patrick was known for driving all the snakes from Ireland into the sea. Did that happen? Well, I don't know. But according to his own testimony in his biography, St. Patrick was known in, in Ireland for being able to raise the dead. And there are accounts on several occasions praying over somebody who had already died, raised to life. In his own testimony, in his own account, St. Patrick said that he had been witness to and a part of 33 instances where people had come back from the dead, and several of those who'd been dead for multiple years. You believe it? You don't. Who would? It's about as the same as people who say, hey, Lord, he's been in there four days. He's stinking already. He's rotten. He can't come out of the tomb. Oh, yeah? Lazarus, come forth. The same power that raised Lazarus from the dead. He lives in us. He lived in St. Patrick. St. Patrick had to make a rough decision because sometimes... <coughs> Our decision to go back to the place of our suffering is the very thing God is going to use to change the world around us. In John 12, 23 and 32, the lectionary gospel reading for today, Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. 
Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said the voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. Was Jesus destined for the cross or did he choose it? Did he make a decision for the cross, or did God just ordain it, and that's the way it is? Remember when Jesus was starting his ministry, he went into the desert for 40 days? What were the decisions he made then? If you're really the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. What did Jesus decide to do? He responded. He made a decision not to yield to his own ability to end his suffering. He said, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Remember when Jesus was with the woman at the well? And the disciples said, we were famished, we went to get food. He must have got food somewhere. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my Father. In the Garden of Gethsemane, did Jesus still make another decision? Father, if it is possible, please Take this cup from me. Did he make a decision in the garden? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus knew his destiny, but Jesus all along the journey had to decide his yes based on his love for his father. I've asked you before, Oswald Chambers asked me this, Did Jesus go to the cross because of his love for you? (coughs) He made a decision to go to the cross based on his love for his Father. Does Jesus love you? Yes. But did he love you enough to go to the cross just for you? That would be rather conceited, don't you think? Jesus has a love that's big enough for the whole world, not just you. Look at someone next to you and say, get over yourself. Go ahead. Uh, (sighs) Poor Steve, he's got five people telling him to get over himself. (laughs) It kind of drives me crazy when I hear people say, if it was only for you, Jesus still would have gone to the cross. Out of eight million people, you're that special that he died just for you? I don't think that's a healthy way of looking at it because it gets us in this me above all else mindset. Jesus, for God so loved most of the world, some of the world, some of us here, for God so loved West Virginia, I hear that's where the toothbrush was invented, Joyan. <laughs> For God so loved the world that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have everlasting. He didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. Did Jesus make decisions? You better believe it. Let me ask you this morning what is your destiny? What has God planted for your life? What are the seeds that he has sown into your heart and to your mind? Let me ask you this. What is your decision? Every one of us today woke up today facing a decision. Am I going to get out of bed or not? Some of you made that decision quicker than others. Joe doesn't mind if I pick on him. He made that decision a little late because I was crossing to make sure my son was up and Joe was about to run me over crossing the street. (laughs) But what are the decisions that face us beyond this day? What's facing you tomorrow, the day after? What is the yes of your life? I heard they were interviewing this morning uh, a couple that had adopted a Down syndrome child from Serbia. And the father was asked, what made you make this decision? And he said, our priest one Sunday asked us 
What is the yes of your life? And he said, we knew. We had talked about adoption. They've got four or five kids. But they said, we had a heart for these children in orphanages, in foreign countries. And we knew that maybe nobody else would adopt this little boy. The uh, interviewer said, you know that most children in America that are diagnosed in utero with the Downs gene, they don't face a very good prospect of life. I remember when Shelly was scared to death as an old couple conceived. Talk about a miracle, amen? And I remember Dr. Doty, hey, are we gonna do this test and this test? She said, she laid out the options for the test because of Shelly's age. I said, doctor, are these tests to determine treatment or options, or are they only to decide if you want to continue the pregnancy? She said, only to continue the pregnancy. I said, doc, we're not taking any of those tests. We'll take what God gives us. Shelly, at four in the morning, scared to death that she was pregnant at age. <laughs> okay, 29 plus. <laughs> but we'd prayed for 11 years, and they said, we're just going to have a baby. Good, bad, ugly, you know. There's a pretty good chance it hit two out of those three. <laughs> what is the yes of your life? What is the decision that God is laying before you today? Some people believe destiny determines the outcomes of our lives. But I came upon a little video, which I believe is a clip from a movie, that I thought was profound in prepar preparing this week. And Cody's going to play that now. Listen closely to the words of this wise man advising a young one. Who do you think really controls a man's life? God or decision? In Deuteronomy 30 verse 15, God himself said, I place before you life and death. In other words, make your choice. So although your life is God-made, the outcome is decision-based. And this is why in your lifetime, yes and no are the biggest words you would ever see. There is no man specially destined for failure. Today's location explains yesterday's decision. You can live your life anyhow you want to live it. And you can only live it once. Although there is freedom of choice, but freedom after choice depends on the choice. The decisions we make control us much more than the circumstances we face. Consciously make a decision. Because indecision in itself is a decision. It only 30 years 50. It's proof that divinity handed destiny over to decision. Your life is in your hands. Decisions decide destiny. powerful what's your destiny I don't know what's your decision what will you say no to more importantly what will you say yes to because those decisions will determine the outcome does God have a plan for your life does he have a will and a desire yes I know the plans I have for you to bless you to give you a hope, to give you a future. If you seek me, you will find me, if you seek me with all your heart. But do you know the decisions that draw you deeper and deeper into the heart of God? The yes. What drives you apart? The no. Isaiah said it. He responded to the Lord's question. The Lord said, who will go for me? 
Anybody here old enough to remember Welcome Back Cotter? What did Horshack do? Ooh, 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 ooh. Here I am, send me. What's the decision you're facing? Your destiny isn't molded by your circumstances. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through is just common to humanity. Do you think you got it bad today? Uh, some of us do. But guess what? You can always find someone who has it. And you can always find somebody who has it better. What good is it to covet God's blessing in somebody else's life? Isn't that a slap in the face to God? What's the decision that looms before you? And what is your response? No or yes? Choice is yours. Anybody here indecisive? Yeah. <laughs> Not deciding is a decision. How many times have you asked your spouse, where do you want to eat? <laughs> and the response is almost always the same. I don't, or I don't care. <laughs> you know what I do? I say, all right, let's go to McDonald's. Well, I don't want to go there. All right, let's go to Burger King. I'm not eating at Burger King. So you do care. <laughs> we always care. We always have an intuition and an instinct. When it comes to God and the opportunities he gives you to make a decision, my prayer for you is let your yes be yes and your no be no. In Matthew 5, 37, Jesus said it very clearly. All you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Yes or no. It really is that simple. Serving God, growing in your relationship, growing in your faith, growing in your walk, being useful to the kingdom of God and building it is as simple as yes or no. Now, a lot of people tell me I need to get way better. Fred, what do you keep telling me? I need to get better at saying what? Yes. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> no. Say yes, Abby. Uh, I guess I look at it this way. If God didn't prevent the decision from coming to me, if he's allowed it, he's got a purpose in it. And if he's allowed it, I'm going to say yes. Will I live to regret it? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I might. <laughs> this is where I struggle. Do all things without complaining or grumbling. You've heard me complain and grumble. I'm working on that. But my yes is pretty good. But I can tell you, if you get used to saying yeses, it will get you into some really, it'll get you into some really interesting situations. But I know this, I will never look back at the end of my life and say, God, on that one, I wish I had said no. I'm never going to have that regret. It is always going to be to my power, to my strength. All right, Lord, yes. What's the decision you face, and what is your reply? You don't get to get out of here without making a decision. So if you can't make up your mind today about staying for lunch, then you have to put the tables and chairs away after lunch. Amen? Can I get a witness? Okay. If you didn't bring food, just go grab some Burger King or McDonald's. There's a Wendy's here. Sue, Sue just said there is plenty down there. All right. So I'm going to pray, and while I'm praying, you make your decision 
about whether you're going to stay or be scorned because you leave and don't come back. Just kidding. We'll still love you. There's plenty of food. Have you ever been to a Nazarene potluck? Have you ever been to a church potluck where there wasn't a food? David? No. Let's pray. Father, oh man, I saw the Lord be with Dave. Abby is on his case, Lord. <laughs> Help him to say yes, Lord. <laughs> Let the house not be divided against itself. <laughs> Lord, thank you that we can laugh even though life is hard. We can have joy in the midst of the fiery furnace or the lion's den. We can have hope in the midst of suffering and even say, use it, Lord, not only to grow us, but to strengthen those who are part of our lives. Lord, this 18-year journey for Sandy has not simply grown her faith. It's grown Ray's faith, her children's faith, her grandchildren's faith. Thank you that even though we don't long to suffer, you're able to use our yes in our suffering to accomplish your will in the lives of those that we love and in our life as well. We give our suffering, we give our difficulties, we give our circumstances to you. And we pray that in the midst of these trying days that you give us the ability to say yes and trust that every yes we say will draw us deeper in our faith because we can't do it without you. In our suffering, your strength is made perfect, and your grace is truly sufficient. May the yeses of our life that open difficulties, it's never convenient to say yes. It's never easy to say yes, but it will always draw us to our dependence upon you to see us through accomplishing what that yes means for our lives. Thank you for this day to celebrate somebody who said yes long ago. And as we remember St. Patrick's yes to go back to his place of suffering, what a great and incredible work you did through his life, through his yes, for the sake of building your kingdom. May our yeses produce in us, in our families, in our communities, the same kingdom-building power that we saw through his yes. And most of all, through the yes of your son, Jesus Christ, who, while knowing your will for his life, still, again and again, we see through the word, Jesus coming back saying, hey, this is going to be tough. I'm troubled. I'm dreading this. But again and again, knowing what the yes meant, he said yes, so that through his death, death itself might be defeated. Through his resurrection, we might know life and that abundantly here and now and in the life to come. And we give you the praise and the thanks for that. We give you the glory. We give you the honor this day. And we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Jesus, bless the food that we're about to eat. Help us to gather in your glory and your honor and to fellowship and to draw us deeper into family and the life that you call us to live. Bless the food so that we can go downstairs right now and eat. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Community life group. How many of you have been to a life group so far? I'm not looking, so you can raise your hand. Go downstairs, sit at a table. We're going to have a one-body life group. Stick around and join us downstairs. It is 1145, so a life group is one life group downstairs. Please see Nancy. How many volunteers do we need? She would like six. She has zero. For Good Friday camp, all you have to do is make sure no children get lost or eaten by rabid dogs or run over by a bus. If you can handle that, you can be a volunteer. That's as simple as it is. Please let Nancy know before you leave if you're able to volunteer for Good Friday camp.
so we can provide this to our community. God bless you. You are dispersed. Greet one another as you leave. If you got to run home and grab a pie or grab something at Burger King, but there really will be plenty of food downstairs. We hope you'll stay and join us.